Hey, this is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and this episode of 10 Minutes With, I get a chance to talk to Jim Ockmoody about his new book, Smoke Lore, A Short History of Barbecue in America. The book, though, is not short. It's 50,000 words of text. There are 208 illustrations and photos contained within. I think there's 20, 26 recipes in it, and it's really, really fantastic. It's a beautiful book. It's, it's definitely something that you will be... Uh, going through again and again. I've read it once through. I'm going through it one more time. I wanted to read you guys quickly the introduction, which was really interesting. It's, I've always wondered why we say something is as American as apple pie. Nothing against apple pie, but history tells us that apples came from Asia by way of Europe and that the British fancied baking them into pies long before anyone on this side of the Atlantic did. If you're looking for a food that truly represents the new world, you would be hard-pressed to find a better one than barbecue. In a sense, America began with barbecue, and it goes on, and it's, <laughs> it's it's really, really well done, and as you'll get from this interview, and I'll put a link to my last interview with him, Jim is a great storyteller, and it's, it's all about the history and about specific subjects within the history of American barbecue, but it's told in a way that it's like you're having a chat with Jim. It's, it comes out right here on the page, and the breakdown of chapters really quick, the smoke of a distant shore, the cradle, big feeds, south by southwest, pig sandwiches, a movable feast, backyard bliss, the color of Q, of pits and poets, sauce, trophies as tall as steers, a world of barbecue. And he gets into gender, he gets into race, he gets into everything that barbecue is about. But I, I just I can't thank Jim enough for, for making this book for us, for creating this book for us, because it's something that you will use, and if you love barbecue, you'll... Uh, it's, it's definitely something you want to do. And if you have a friend or anybody that you know that loves barbecue, this is such a fantastic book to give them. They will see that you <laughs> really care about uh, them learning about the history. Because when you learn about the history of something, it, it opens that world that you're involved with up so much more. So I can't thank him enough. You're really going to enjoy this. And this episode of the Kevin's Barbecue Joints podcast is sponsored by The Smoke Sheet. The Smoke Sheet is a barbecue newsletter. It comes into your email box every Wednesday. It's available at bbqnewsletter.com. That's bbqnewsletter.com. It was started, I've mentioned it before, by Ryan Cooper, who is at BBQ Tourist, and Sean Ludwig, who is at NYC Barbecue. They're intelligent. They care about barbecue. They travel a lot. So they're on the streets, so to say, within the barbecue world, but then they also... Uh, are scouring the United States uh, barbecue scene for information and news. So this is chock full of news and openings and closings and where barbecue guys are going and what events are coming up, which is such a key thing for this. this is, I love the fact that there's all these barbecue events that are coming up and they list them, let you know where they are. They have links to barbecue YouTube stuff, all the barbecue podcasts. Sometimes I get a link, which is cool, but not always. It's uh, they, they definitely choose what's cool, what makes sense during that week uh, to post. They have a barbecue recipe of the week, which is a really good recipe. And I've had people actually email me, honestly, and said they use that recipe all the time. So that makes me feel good, and I'm glad you guys are signing up for it. And I know it's a great resource. And also, there's original content, too, which is... So it's kind of like a magazine slash news, newsletter, which everything is a hybrid thing these days. But it's, uh, it's like the future of newsletters. Again, it's available at bbqnewsletter.com. That's bbqnewsletter.com. The spoke sheet is barbecue news worth consuming. And as always, thank you so much for listening. I totally appreciate it. I've been getting a lot of feedback these days, and it really makes me feel good because it's nice to know that other people are like-minded and that they like hearing either the journey that someone goes through to open up a barbecue place or what their place is in the barbecue world and how they uh, they fit into all this. So it's uh, I'm really, really glad that it's uh, resonating with you guys. Uh, I have a website at kevinsbbqjoints.com. The YouTube channel, if you're just listening to us on the podcast, is youtube.com slash kevinsbbqjoints. Subscribe to that. Subscribe to the podcast. That way you don't miss out on anything. Once again, thanks so much. Enjoy this. Good morning, Jim. How are you doing? 
Hey, Kevin. Thank you very much. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Nice to talk to you again. I'm excited. Your book is out because when we talked before, your book wasn't out. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> Smoke Lore. What's the complete title? It's called Smoke Lore, A Short History of Barbecue in America. My publisher wanted to put short in there to telegraph to people that it wasn't a big, weighty doorstop of an academic tome. But I've had other people tell me that short means, well, Jim, why didn't you do your job and make it a full history? <laughs> it is a full history. It's, it's, it's 50,000 words of text and 208 illustrations wow. and 26 recipes. So there, there's a short just means that this is going to be entertaining. It's popular history. Gotcha. And, and, and that you can consume it's consumable. It's not something that's going to take right. you six years to read. It's barbecue. It's meant to be fun. Exactly. So let's let's talk about let's talk about the journey to creating the book, and then about the book, and then like kind of where you're because right now today is June something June nineteenth, twenty twenty one, somewhere around there, uh, mid June. It's the twentieth. Yesterday was June tenth. Oh yeah, June tenth. <laughs> I should know. My brother's birthday is June 18th and mine's June 9th, so I should know this. Um, <laughs> they, uh, yes. So, so what was the journey leading up to this, and how did this come about? It was because of Barbecue Nation. Yeah, I, I was a reporter and editor at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the big newspaper here, for almost 30 years. And I never was a full-time food writer, but I always wrote a, a lot about food because one of my specialties at the Atlanta paper was writing about Southern culture and history. And you find pretty quickly on that, you know, if you're writing, if you, if you care about that subject and write about it, you're going to write a lot about music and food and literature. And, uh, and so I always was, I remember one of the first food stories I ever wrote at the Atlanta paper was about new Coke back in the mid eighties. Oh, really? uh, it was basically, yeah, it was basically a feature about why should anybody care about them changing the, the, uh, formula to Coca-Cola. And what you find out of course, is that for a lot of people in the deep south, Coca Cola is in their veins, mm -hmm. and it's uh, and it's very. It was a very emotional thing for them, and my story was really a piece of cultural anthropology more than it was a cooking food story. That makes sense. So so did, people care did, deeply about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of food stories like that, and and I always wrote uh, in and around barbecue. Uh, my it runs deeply in my family. On my father's side, there are. Pit masters going back several generations. My grandfather, in particular, was a pretty noted pit master in northwest Georgia near the town of Cartersville. So I always grew up with these stories and knowing a lot about it. So I wrote a lot of barbecue things off and on over the years for the AJC. Uh, I co wrote a barbecue sauce cookbook in 1995 with the food editor, Susan Puckett. Uh, and so, so I'd, al I'd already done a lot of this. So when the Atlanta History Center, which is the big history museum here, they, they had this idea to do this uh, exhibition about the history and culture of barbecue, Barbecue Nation. Yeah. They asked me to be an advisor on it, and I sort of got sucked in uh, into it more deeply and more deeply. I was, at first an I was at first an advisor, and then they asked me, along with the University of Georgia Press, the publisher of Smoke Lore, if I would do the companion volume. And I thought it was going to be a book where, like, you know, I would edit essays by a bunch of different people, and I would just have a sort of that kind of involvement. But it turned out they wanted like a really original history of barbecue, and I thought it was a great idea. So I said, "Yeah, I'll do that." And then later on, they asked me to be a guest curator for the exhibition when the person who had been doing it for some years, uh, for for all sorts of personal reasons, ended up uh, backing out of it. I was involved <laughs> in every level of it. Uh, so I've had uh, I've had a pretty intensive involvement in barbecue beyond just my normal interest in family history with it okay. over the last ten years. You have the credentials. Well, now with Smokler, when you started out, did you already have a lot of these stories? In, did you already have a lot of it uh, mapped out in your head, or did, did did you just start from complete scratch? Or how did how did you go about? It? Because to to take on it, that's a that's a big task to take on. I knew a lot about barbecue, and I knew a lot of a lot of stories, and I knew, but but. Did I know the real history of barbecue, and I, did, did I know the non-Southern history of barbecue? And the answer is no. I had to go and research it like any other, like a journalist would research any other topic. And one of the things that, that sort of surprised me is to find out that e even though barbecue, as we all know, is very largely a Southern and Southwestern uh, uh, story in the United States. It's a much more national story than I ever would have imagined. 
we in Georgia sort of have this idea that if it ain't pig and it doesn't have a southern accent, it's not barbecue, and, and we're wrong. <laughs> we're no, wrong. No, it's, it's a lot broader than that. Oh, without a doubt. That's that, that's kind of why I'm doing this here because it's it's changed, and I think it's changed a lot over the last decade or two. I think it's it's evolved into something even bigger too. And then you find out that certain regions have roots deeper than you might have realized. Well, I mean, one of the things uh, that most surprised me was to find out that the whole rise of backyard cooking was not really a Southern phenomenon. Uh, the, the way that Americans uh, started cooking in the backyard didn't come from the South. It didn't come from Texas. Um, it, it really is largely out of California. Interesting. It's, uh, oh, yeah. My, my yeah, book the, comes uh, today, so I haven't had a chance to, to delve into it. So ooh, that's, in, that's really interesting. Well, the, uh, you know, the, the first place that really promoted the idea of cooking in the backyard was, was uh, uh, Sunset Magazine, okay. which was the Union Pacific, Union Pacific Railroad started this magazine in the late 1900s, 1800s, to promote California and the West Coast for mm -hmm. immigration and for tourism. And uh, early in the 1900s, they started promoting the idea of building a brick pit in your backyard and cooking. Wow. And yeah, and they have articles in Sunset Magazine in the teens and the twenties talking about cooking this way. And you know, is it is it barbecue like a North Carolinian would recognize it? Is it a whole hog being smoked all day or smoked all night? No, of course not. But it's but it's a it's another family tree of barbecue, another branch in the family tree. Um, they're what they're really selling is masonry pits inspired by Mexican ranchero cooking. Okay, very similar to Santa Maria. I was going to say that's that, that, yeah. it's direct heat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and so uh, it, it but it doesn't come from the south. Uh, it's not inspired by traditional pits in the south in Texas, and and in fact the first real barbecue cookbook in America was published in 1938 by Sunset, the Sunset Barbecue Cookbook. Really, uh, and they're they're really wonderful. And if you look at and if you look at the, the cookbooks are wonderful. You can get them on eBay. They're really neat. They I'm have sort to. of faux wooden covers, um, oh, that's and so they cool. have these really pretty uh, woodcut illustrations in them. And if you look at one, some of the early model uh, uh, editions of this cookbook, because they put them out in annual editions for decades, they half the book is dedicated to building the pit wow. and maintaining the pit. And then oh, and then there's some recipes in the back. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. So, do they talk about are they are the bricks those those fireproof bricks or those in, those specific or do they just say build is it or a cinder block? How are they how are they building these? Well, they're building very nice high end bricks. Uh, uh, fire, I mean, and they look beautiful. And you know, it a lot of the early barbecue backyard barbecue in America was actually masonry pits. If you go and read things up until I would say the er, mid fifties. It's more likely that you're going to find a pit in the backyard is what people are cooking on. The whole idea of mobile cookers, uh, like the, the, the first model that Charbroiled in Georgia brought out in the late 1940s or that uh, Hasty Bake brought out in, in uh, Oklahoma in the 1940s or, of course, the famous Weber Kettle, which mm -hmm. came out in the early 50s. After these others, incidentally, they didn't invent it. Uh, those, that idea of cooking on portable things in your backyard was is actually the second generation the first generation of backyard cooking is masonry pits think about the famous episode of i love lucy where lucy loses her wedding ring and the mate she thinks she's lost it in the masonry of mm -hmm. a brick pit that ricky and uh, fred have built in the back of their new place in suburban con con connecticut when they move out of uh -huh. the city oh yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. To me, that's sort of a, a, a landmark moment that sort of tell, tells you how national barbecue is becoming. And that episode ran in 1957, I think. Well, that was yeah. interesting because as you say that, I was, I'm thinking back to in one of my, like one of the second, I think the second house that my parents owned, there was a brick pit in the backyard, but I think my dad had painted it like a yellowish color on the outside, but it was a brick pit that he grilled on that he used for... Yeah. Yeah, I, but and it was had a weird door at the bottom that you put the the wood in or the coals. I I don't remember. I was too young, but that's that's interesting. With that, <laughs> wow. but those, those brick pits are sort of the first generation. Well, I guess the first generation is 
digging a trench in your in yeah. your yard, <laughs> yeah. which is you know very. That's kind of what they did in the really old days in the mm-hmm. South and Texas and places like that. But the uh, but the brick pits kind of like the second generation, and then the mobile cookers. Uh-huh. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the smokers and the grills and things like that that are actually on wheels, they vary. A few of those came along right before World War II, but most of them are a post-war development. Okay. Wow, that's interesting. Wow, this is this is really great already. I think I, I'm scared because this is not going to take 10 minutes. But what? so, so let, let's, let's continue going on. And what else did you learn? I, 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 I'll open it up to you because this is so great. Well, I did a whole chapter in the book on the question of whether or not black people invented barbecue. It's kind of a controversial question. And the, you know, the a lot of people ask me, didn't African-Americans invent barbecue because they're so associated with it? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a prickly subject because the answer is no, they didn't. Barbecue actually has roots on about five different continents. Okay, that makes sense. And is one of the reasons I really love barbecue and think it's worthy of really serious study, besides tasting great and having great traditions and yeah. colorful traditions, is that I think it's the most representative American food. I really think it's our truly national food because it's so intertwined with our history. True. It goes back to the beginning of the settlement of this country. It goes back to the earliest days of the Republic, you know, at the, at the cornerstone laying of the U.S. Capitol building in 1793 uh, when George Washington oversaw the, the Masonic ceremony and all that. What did they do after that? They went and had a barbecue. <laughs> it was an ox barbecue, a beef barbecue. Okay. Um, so I think because of how intertwined it is in our history, it's, it's our most American food. But I also think it, it is because it, re- it represents us so well. It has roots in all these different continents with almost every ethnic group that makes up America. True. Among those ethnic groups, African Americans obviously have had a huge uh, influence in it. Uh, in the early days of colonial barbecue and, and before the Civil War in the South, barbecue was mostly a big event food. And so when they were having a barbecue that Washington writes in his diary about going to, the father of our country certainly wasn't cooking that barbecue. It was, it was their slaves. And so they had a great influence on it. But can you say black people invented barbecue? No, you can't. It's more complicated than that. What you can say is they're so profoundly identified with barbecue in ways that are both admirable and stereotypical and offensive. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're so identified with barbecue that it, just, it seems like they invented it. So I think that I think that's a fascinating subject. So fascinating. I thought it was I, – I devoted a whole chapter to it because I thought um, – uh, I, I thought it was so many people had asked me about it. I thought it was worthy of answering that question in a detailed way. Yeah, and to delve deeper into that subject, yeah. I think that's really important. Wow, that's incredible! I, I can't. I seriously cannot wait to get my hands on this tonight. What are some other little um, portions of the book that people, the notable portions? I, it's, I'm sure it's all notable, but that pe- that you want to highlight? Well, I mean, you know. I highlight a lot of the usual, the, the things that you would expect, which is, you know, the, the, the profound identity barbecue has with the South and the, the cradle, how it first appeared on this continent. Really, it took root on this continent in Virginia and North Carolina and possibly South Carolina. So, but you, you expect that. I mean, anybody who's sure. been to the Skylight Inn knows that that's actually, you're seeing right there a yeah. taproot uh, to, to, you know, what Daniel and Sam have written about. <laughs> That's a representative of the oldest barbecue tradition in America. So um, um, in some way, so all those things are given. We know those things. Um, I'm kind of interested in the things we don't know. I was very interested in the whole question of barbecue and gender. Why aren't there more women in barbecue mm-hmm. history? Um, I don't think you can argue with the idea that men have more of an affinity for barbecue and the person cooking barbecue over the years has tended to be a man, but I don't think it's quite as male-centric as our representation of the history has always led us to believe. Mm. Um, there, you know, anytime a meal is being made, women are involved. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, and that's going way back. Historically, and, yes. You know, yeah, I mean, so uh, we don't know. We know very little about women and barbecue in the 1800s because we don't really know all that much about barbecue in the 1800s. Most of the written references to barbecue way back in our history have to do with events, political barbecue, sure, and things like that. Idea. You know that they're there, 
And, you know, some of my friends at the History Center who really have thought about all this history and have had to deal with gender and lack thereof and a lot of things they, that they document told me that a, a very wise thing. They said that sometimes the absence of something that you know there is actually the story. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Though so women have already been always been involved, and we know that in recent times, uh, it's it's a more documented history. I mean, look at the Kansas City Barbecue Society. The driving force for many years has been Carolyn Wells. She was one of the co-founders. You know, when I was writing about barbecue at the Atlanta Journal Constitution for years, you'd always call Kansas City and get that smoky Carolyn Wells voice in your story. <laughs> uh, look at uh, uh, you know Barbecue Hall of Fame, Tootsie Tom and Nets, and and uh, it snows barbecue in in Texas. Yeah, Icon uh, an iconic figure in so many ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and we've got several notable uh, uh, you know women pitmasters in in Georgia uh, that. Oh, my cat just walked in and yeah, decided it's to an agreement. She's agreeing. Or he's agreeing. <laughs> yeah, she. No, it's she. She's a... Well, there she you says, go. Yeah, get the women in that story. Very appropriate. Uh, <laughs> but So that, that interested me. And it also interests me that during the period when barbecue was first starting to go national in the post-war years, when, when people who were far away from the barbecue hotbeds were getting interested in cooking out in their backyard and stuff like that, uh, when you started seeing all these cookbooks by people like James Beard about cooking out or uh, articles and all the pub better homes and gardens and things like that, it sort of coincided with the most stereotypical moment for gender relations in this country's history. Hmm. In, the, in the 1950s and early 1960s, the barbecue writing is all full of men do the fire work and wear the vestments and all that. And women, you know, uh, you know, I think James Beard in his, in his cookout book says something about, you know, women, barbecue is men's work. Women shouldn't get involved. Oh, that's hilarious. And, and every, yeah. Everybody's saying that back then. And we know the women got involved. Hell, they made the sides, they cleaned up and probably ran the grill when, I'm sure, when, yeah. when, when hubby had too many beers. You yeah. Know? When he was, um, yeah. <laughs> or so, yeah, trying to do business somewhere off to the side. It's it is funny. Yeah. If you go back and look at this stuff in the fifties and sixties, everybody was sort of invested in this idea that this is how this was man's work and women didn't do it. And it's kind of comical when we look back at it. Now we have some fun with it in the exhibition at the Atlanta history center. Oh, and that's and that exhibition too is running through September of 2019. It's running through September 29th, 29th of this okay. year. So it, it they extended it because it was very popular. Can you stop? Can you go there and get a copy of your book? Oh Lord, yeah. My first event for the book was in late May at the History Center. We actually had it in. Uh, there's a there's a kind of a big common space outside the exhibition, and we had it there set up. Perfect. We had a very nice round set up. Everything there had it. Uh, had it uh, catered by one of the better new barbecue places in Atlanta, Das Barbecue. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned that in your in your uh, barbecue tour that we went through. Yeah, they're they're a good place. No, it was it was terrific, and we had it there because we wanted people to come and wander through the exhibition. Oh, that's so great! So so then people can pick pick up your book anywhere, right? Online, uh, any bookstore oh, yeah. that still exists. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's available at all the usual places, Amazon, indie, IndieBound.com, uh, you know, Barnes & Noble. It's available from the University of Georgia website. It's available on my website, yes. JimAkmoody.com. And I'll link to that in the show notes. So. Yes. And, uh, and yeah, uh, you know, and if you don't see it in your bookstore, ask them to order it mm -hmm. because we think that we, th this isn't a Southern or a Texas thing exclusively. This is a history of barbecue in America. And the fact that I'm a, you know, a, a, a deep rooted Georgian and know the Southern tradition better than anything else probably means that the way I wrote, it's a little bit more Dixie centric mm -hmm. than say somebody from Lubbock, Texas would have written it. But nonetheless, it is a national history. And I tried very hard to find out about things like how California sort of burst backyard cooking and things like that. Well, I know. I, th I think if, if you love barbecue or are interested in barbecue, I, it, I know it's, it's going to be important for people to purchase because it's, it's important. I think, I, I think it's, it's great to, love barbecue and eat barbecue but I think knowing about the history and knowing a little bit more about these places and 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 where we've come from I think that's important I think it, I think it makes the experience even greater when you visit a barbecue spot or when you visit an old spot like I think knowing a little bit more of the history of anything I think helps and I think and let me say one other thing about the book too is that it's fun there's a lot of eye candy in there there's a lot of old so advertisements from the 50s and 60s in magazines. Oh. Uh, uh, there's a great archival uh, Library of Congress stuff. There's uh, there are 208 
pieces of artwork in it, and a lot of them are just loads of fun. So, you know, if you didn't, I want you to read the book, but if you did nothing but buy it and flip through and look at the pictures, you would also enjoy it. Yeah, if your eyes are too tired to read, it's going to be super enjoyable. That sounds like just that alone would be really cool to look at. Right. That was, I mean, I, this book took me a long time because it was, you know, I had to research it and write it, but a great deal of it was actually curating the photos oh, yeah. and getting permissions arranged and all of that, and that was, of course, a lot of the fun of it. Yeah, because then you interact with these people, and and then maybe it opens up a Pandora's box to different things too. That you additional photos, a different different. That's awesome. That's really really cool. I'm so I'm excited for you because when we talked back, like it was almost a year ago, uh, this book hadn't come out. So I'm excited. Mm -hmm. And how, how what's the response so far? Oh, it, it, the response has been great. We've gotten really nice reviews. There was the Associated Press did a nice review earlier this week that was uh, uh, has been picked up. Up and by the Washington Post and the Houston uh, paper and a bunch of other places, uh, we've gotten good mentions in uh, Garden and Gun magazine, oh, which yeah, is a general thing here. Uh, 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 Southern Living, uh, Texas Monthly. Uh, I did something on Stephen Reichland's uh, website. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm writing a piece for the Washington Post right now. Oh, that's uh, great. There, there, there's a terrific online magazine in the South called The Bitter Southerner. I just did a piece for them I about politics and barbecue, which is a very, very rich subject. And, I can, and, and in fact, I'm doing a talk next week at the Jimmy Carter Library here in Atlanta specifically about politics and barbecue. Oh, that's great. I'll put links to all these. And I'll, I'll try to do a com companion blog piece because it sounds like there's a lot to get to. So that way people can, can link up to all that because I think that, that too will expand people's knowledge about barbecue and about what you're doing. And you bring so much to the table. And just I know that people listening to this will know what they're getting into when they purchase this because it's uh, – you have you have such a deep knowledge and a passion for what you're doing. I I, I appreciate. I I thank you from everyone else. What you're do, what you're doing is is phenomenal, important. Well, there there are a lot of people who are writing good stuff about barbecue now sure. and doing doing things like you're doing, uh, and so there's a lot of interest in it, um, and um, I I think it's I think it's our moment. I think it is too. No, I think so, and it's and it's, it's exciting because there is so much to learn and so much to gain, and and talking to people. They, that's why I like to interact with different people because there's so much to learn from their stories, or at least from from their background and their passion, and and, and share their passion because that's all it's all about. We're all we're just doing things that we love, and and hopefully it it translates to other people. Yeah, you know, I actually did a talk. You know the folk artist Howard Fenster, mm -hmm. uh, who, did, who did covers for REM and Talking Heads and yeah. all that. He's probably the best known folk artist in America. Uh, he passed away some years ago. His home in uh, in, in Northwest Georgia is is a uh, like a historic site now, oh. and they have a festival there every Memorial Day weekend. And I did a talk up there uh, oh. late last month about the culinary folk art of barbecue. Uh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I just thought, I thought when you think about barbecue and how sort of uh, uh, individual and uh, colorful and idiosyncratic it is and how a lot of the places actually feel like folk art environments, uh, I just thought it was a perfect tie-in. It's a perfect. It is perfect. Yeah. And so from your website, can people see where you're go going to be speaking at or where you'll be appearing? Do you have a, a list of events coming up? As soon as I update it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's what's the best way to get that information? Facebook, maybe. But yeah, they do. I've got. Um, uh, yes, I'm. I'm going to have updated there. There, and I've got some of the stuff on there now. I need to go in and update it a little bit more. I know I'm going to be going. They're actually they're sending me to Kansas City and Austin and oh. uh, Raleigh Durham and uh, Richmond, I think. And I'm doing a thing at a bookstore there. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. I'm, yeah. No, okay. Well, I. Definitely. Um, yeah. Well, you definitely need to eat everywhere you're going. That's uh, that's a given, right? You have to do that. Yeah, and 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 in mid July, I have to have my cholesterol checked. So I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm scared. I have to do that this summer. Too. <laughs> I'm worried. And, and, you know, and, and and you get invitations from places you don't like. Uh, Pat Conroy, uh, oh. the, the great Southern writer. He the, it, where where he uh, spent a lot of his adulthood in Beaufort, South Carolina. They have the Pat Conroy Literary Center, and they've invited me to come over and do a thing oh. there on the, uh, July the fourth weekend. And that's that's going to be kind of interesting. That's really neat. I'm excited for you. And so I'm and taking 
taking a bottle of Ernest Hemingway barbecue sauce, which I didn't even know. There's a barbecue sauce line that's related to Ernest Hemingway that I saw in the grocery store last night, and I thought, oh, my God, writers are doing barbecue sauces wow, now? we do. <laughs> From the grave. <laughs> you know, it's funny as I was telling somebody about how – isn't there a, is there a Hemingway book about his – where he travel, travels with Charlie or something, where he traveled with his dog across the United States? John Steinbeck. That was Steinbeck. Steinbeck. That was okay. Steinbeck. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I knew. Okay. Yeah. And it's, no, and it's, it's, and it's a great book. It's one of the sort of seminal American mm-hmm. travel logs mm-hmm. yeah, from yeah. A lot of the early wanted, 60s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I need to reread that again. It's, uh, it's Steinbeck. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, I, Let's, well, I, have, I have a thing in the book about all the uh, – T- times of barbecue has appeared in uh, in literature, American mm-hmm. literature, and a lot of them are things you would expect. They're like Faulkner and Southern things, and, and uh, Alice Walker and yeah. Tony Morrison and people like that. But there are a bunch of them you wouldn't expect. I mean, there, there's one from Raymond Chandler. <laughs> wow, <laughs> in L.A. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I have to get the book. Well, let's let's jump on to. I have. I always ask three random questions at the end of mm-hmm. if I can remember to do that. My uh, okay. the first question is: If you weren't doing what you're doing right now, was there something as a child or growing up that you wanted to do that you wish you could have done? Uh, I was uh, always interested in architecture. I used to, and still to some day when I'm doodling, I design houses and things oh. like that. Uh, and and I, I've always been interested in historic preservation. I love old houses oh, and yeah. I love historic neighborhoods. And we, and my wife and I go on uh, tours of, uh, you know, we went on one last year, Columbus, Georgia, the old oh. historic houses. Uh, I have a lot of different interests within journalism. Um, I never, I occasionally wrote about sports, but I never was a sports writer. And I remember one time about 10 years into my career, we got one of those like, you know, where are you questionnaires about your, uh, your, your career and what you want to do, blah, 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 from the management. And I wrote in there sort of halfway, half seriously that I'd make a great national baseball writer. And like 10 minutes later, the main editor called me up and said, are you serious? Because we can do that. <laughs> we can make that happen. And I had to think to myself, okay, do I? That, that would be really cool, but do I really want to spend like uh, nine months of the year on the road. Yeah, <laughs> that would be a grind. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, they're always they're they're always the things I'm interested. I love baseball, and they're things I'm interested in, and always pass not taken. Uh, but I have no I have no regrets. But it, it, what it means is you can always find things you're interested in writing about. For sure, and I always feel like it's never too late. I've, t- I've asked these this question to a number of people, and they've said it kind of seems like they almost could do that later on. Like you could, uh, being a national uh, writer for baseball is probably something you could have done too, but you can get into architecture and especially visiting. Like that's, I think you're my cousin in some way. There's some way, like a lot of the interests that you have are the same interests I have. Uh-huh. So, and then the second question is, is there something specific that you're listening to right now musically? Well, I'm not the most contemporary person when it comes to musical taste. I mean, if, if something uh, crosses, uh, comes across my ears that I like that's contemporary, I certainly I'm open to it, and I and I go listen to it. But what I'm more likely to do is to mine the past and find out things that even came out before I was born. I mean, like uh, you know, one of my enthusiasms in the last year, I was on Spotify and I was just listening to all this stuff that Harry Belafonte recorded in the '50s. Wow. Uh, really, a lot of his folk music, and not just the calypso stuff. Uh, and it's he was an incredible recording star in the 50s and early 60s and we all we know him for three songs mm-hmm. and he sad. recorded he re, well well it's not sad it's just the way things you know true, it's just true, the way true. it is you know and um and i was going back and listening to some of the stuff that he recorded back then american folk songs and things and oh. he had such a wonderful voice and so much feeling and he was really a sex symbol of his time um that that's what I do is I go back and I rediscover things, you know, I, I remember a few years ago, I read I, I rediscovered Louis Prima and I said, Oh my God, this guy was rock and roll before rock and roll or, 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 uh, Louis Jordan. I, I did the same thing with him. I mean, so I, I always like, I, I kind of like going back and mining in the past and I seem to have a special affinity for the music that came out in the forties and the fifties. That's just before my consciousness, my consciousness really is Ed Sullivan on the Beatles and then forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like there's this trend with you. Like there's a thread that you like to mine the past. That's something that, that's a passion of yours. Is, is I'm a historian. historian. I'm, a hist- I'm a journalist and a historian yeah, is what I really am. Yeah. For sure. So it kind of made sense that that was your answer. And then my last question is, is there a restaurant that you're going to now in your area or in Atlanta that, uh, that you're really into that's not barbecue? Something not barbecue. Well, it, there are a lot of good restaurants. 
restaurants in Atlanta, and, and the, the Atlanta restaurant scene has just gone crazy. And we always we like to go try things. Uh, we tried this great new French place uh, uh, for our anniversary uh, called Tiny Lou's. It's in an old sort of it's a flea bag hotel on Ponce de Leon in Midtown Atlanta that's been redone as a hipster place, of course. the Hotel Claremont. I think. They have they have a strip bar in the basement that Anthony Bourdain visited when he did his uh, Atlanta uh, thing I on his CNN that, show. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, this is just above. Actually, on their menu, it says we're upstairs from the strippers. Um, and but I like that. But probably one of my favorite restaurants in Atlanta, and it, uh, and it is of a lot of other people, is called Miller Union. It's in the old stockyard area of Atlanta in Northwest Atlanta, where they used to sell. People, farmers would come to town and buy mules or buy livestock and or cows and stuff over there. And but it's a, it's a really great award-winning restaurant, Miller Union. And what they're really known for is having the best southern vegetables in Atlanta. Oh, wow. And when you eat barbecue, you you really prize places where you can go and not eat meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> especially a, a white selection yeah, because it, because life is finding balance. Yeah, <laughs> that's our goal, is it? Yeah, oh. Right. Well, that sounds. I want to. I can't wait to visit, and I hope, hopefully, when I do visit soon in the next couple of months, that I can hang out with you a little bit because I, I, it would be that would be an honor to have to travel to a number of places with you because then I could you could learn a little bit more. I'd be I'd be stealing a little bit of your knowledge because it would be so great. But I, I, I am, I'm so excited for the launch of your book and for your little book tour that you're doing. It's just I'm excited. This is great. Thank you for taking the time too. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Excellent. Well, have a yeah, have, have a great week.